Hey everyone, welcome to Calvary Church Online. My name is Pastor John Mark and I'm the online church pastor here at Calvary. Whatever platform you're joining us on or listening from, it's such an honor that you've joined us online. Here at Calvary, our vision is to help you connect with God and one another. Everything that we do revolves around those two things and our chosen method for connecting with others is meetups. There are three different types of meetups. We have interest-based, current needs-based, and Bible study-based. All of our meetups are designed to help you find connection with others and give you an opportunity to grow in your faith. If you call Calvary Church home, there are three ways that you can give your tithes and offerings today. One, you can head to calvaryptbo.church online. Just click on the giving tab at the top of the page. Two, you can send e-transfer to donations at calvaryptbo.church. Or three, you can drop it off at the main office during the week. If you have any questions about anything that we've mentioned today, visit our website at calvaryptbo.church. It's your best resource to stay connected to everything that is happening each week. That's all for me for now. And again, we want to thank you so much for joining us today online. Our online service is about to begin and it all starts right now. Well, thank you for joining us today. We're still in our series on listen, learn, live for the Father. And we have this recognition that we are the children of God, and I will be a father to you, God says, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. What a great privilege to be the children of God. And because we're His children, we want to please the Father. And so we're in this series talking about what that might look like. And we start, we consider this whole idea of the great commandment that if we're really going to please the Father, we should love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength. And I've identified that as loving God first, most, and best. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on in the great commandment. He says we should also love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And it appears from the scripture and the way they're written that if we really love God, then the evidence of that will not just be how we love God, but the evidence of that will actually be loving one another. And so Jesus comes along and he takes the commandments of the Old Testament, which are based on the law, and he translates those into a new law. It's called the law of love. And so here's what he says, for example. This is, these are the words of Jesus now. A new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And then in 1 John, the disciple of Jesus who lived the longest and had seen the church for many, many years, he was just a teenager, it appears, when he became a follower of Jesus. He says this in 1 John, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. And so this last week, we talked about what does that look like? What does it mean to love one another? It means we talk about them kindly and graciously. We're not harsh. It means we don't become judgmental. It means we don't take the law and put it against them or hold it against them. One of the problems with the law and rules is they have a tendency to make us critical, negative, judgmental, and even makes us hypocrites. And so that's not God's plan for us. God's plan is actually to learn to love one another. And it's not easy. It doesn't come natural for us, but that's God's plan for us. And he actually, again, the same writer in 1 John, John himself, tells us a little bit of what that might look like. And so I thought I would read it to you. It's a little bit long, the text, but it's worth reading, I think. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, this is amazing now, no one's ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and His love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in Him and He is in us. He has given us of His Spirit, and we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love made us complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, 
But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates, big word, hates his brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Now this is written clearly to the church. It's really written to people who already know Jesus, who are part of a relationship, that are already part of the family of God. But, but the great commandment really defines that, but we want to be really careful what that means. And so last week we talked about what it means to love one another as part of the family, of God's family. But in reality, it also starts in other places. It starts with the family at home. If we really say we love God and we really do love God, then we ought to love others. And so we should love the body, but we should also love our spouses. We should also love our kids. We love our extended family. And it's hard to imagine this loving your neighbor part starting there. In fact, the Bible's pretty clear that God loves people beyond the people that we love. It actually says in Peter, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Why would God say that? Because God loves the world. For God so loved the world. He loves everybody, whether they're in the family of God or not. And so we're talking about this as children of God. We are in the family. But it's important for us to understand that God loves those who are not yet in the family as much as he loves those of us who are already there. And that's why he said not only did he give us a great commandment, but he gave us a great commission. Jesus says these words, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So if we're really children of God, if we really know God's love, then we love God. If we really know God's love, then we love others who also love God. If we really love God, we love the extended family that's ours, our blood family. We love them the way God loves them. That's what God asks us to do for everyone. But beyond that, we actually love people who are outside the kingdom, people that we might tend to have a tendency to be judgmental with or be critical of because the sin that's in their life has not been forgiven. They don't live in grace. They don't live in the love of God, and so they behave like sinners. How could they not? That's all they know. But that's who Jesus came and died for. That's that's who he, he died for us. We were in that group, and now we are not. But God wants us to understand how important it is that we actually see our neighbors as not just the people in the kingdom, but the people who are outside the kingdom. And so I, I, I just think it's so important for us to figure out how to do that. What, is that. what does that look like? And so a man by the name of Dan Betzer, a pastor in Fort Myers, Florida, said these words, Do I really expect these victims who are spiritually dying by the side of the road to come to us, all slicked up, shoes shined, and beaming from ear to ear? Hardly. We need to go to them, to where they are, and in Jesus' name, bind up their wounds and attend to their needs. Is it messy? Sometimes. Is it costly? Usually. Is it worth it? The angels of heaven shout yes for every lost soul who comes home. And so the mission of the church really is this great commandment. It's it's just to we go in all the world to make disciples. I, I don't really know all the time how to make disciples in 2023. I do know what a disciple of Jesus looks like. It looks like somebody who's growing in their likeness to Jesus and who loves God, who loves their neighbors, they love themselves. And I know the evidence of people who are disciples. Those are people who make other disciples. And there's a lot of us in the church who are believers, and I believe we're going to heaven. And I wouldn't offend you for the world. I wouldn't, but I need to say for all of us who are truly disciples, if we are, then we make other disciples. And if we're not making other disciples, I think God the Father is saying to us, if you want to please me, that's what I'd like you to do. And that's why he comes and offers us so many times the opportunity to repent and confess. And I trust that by the time we're done today, you'll want to do that as well, that you'll want to give your life on behalf of God to others who are outside the kingdom, invest in them, and help them come to faith. I pondered this for the longest time. How does this work today? What works in 2023? And I do think Peter, writing in his first epistle, gives us a little bit of a hint of what that might look like. So, let's go there. Here here it is, just one verse. 
1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. So there are three assumptions in this verse. Three great assumptions. The first assumption is that you and I have a living relationship with the living God. That we actually are in Christ. But in your hearts, he says, set apart Christ as Lord. And so he has this key word, two words are set apart. Jesus does not call us to be believers only. He actually calls us to be more than that. He calls us to be followers. Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone, you and me, would come after me, he must first deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus is looking for more than a head and heart response. He's looking for more than, he's looking for a whole life response. Loving the kingdom is always action. It's not just words. It's not just feelings. It's actually doing something. That's why he says in James that faith without works is dead, because if we're really in him, that we actually want to work and please him. And one of the ways we do that is we follow the great commandment about love, but we also follow the great commission about giving our lives away for the sake of others. There's an assumption that believers will actually have this Christ walk. They'll actually know who this Father is, and we know who our Savior is, and, and that has set us apart. That has made us unique. It makes us His. It makes us belong to God, and so we can declare that He is our Lord, and we are His servants. Uh, I love Calvin Miller's writing. He's a great writer. He's dead now, but he wrote some amazing, amazing books, and one of those books was called Into the Depths, and in that book, he makes a statement that I think summarizes who we are in this whole issue of loving people outside the kingdom. Here's what he said. We were torn and now we are mended. Useless and now used. We were once cast off commodities, sinners, and now we are the spendable currency of God. Are you a believer? Have you become a follower? Is Jesus the Lord of your life? Then at that moment, God wants us to become his spendable currency. He wants us to be be the money that he can use to influence and buy others. It's a really bad illustration. But the reality is he wants us to be part of his plan of reconciliation. Listen, listen Listen to what a man named Paul writes in Corinthians. And all things are from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sin against them, and has entrusted us with the message of reconciliation. So the first great assumption in this text is that we're actually in Christ, and we actually care about the things that God cares about, and we actually care about people who are outside the kingdom because God cares about them as much as he cares about people in the kingdom. There's another assumption in this text, these few words. The second great assumption is this. And the assumption is that our life involves others. It says this, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you. And the big, the big word here is ask. For far too many people, I think we have believed that if we just run church right, if we just, if we just have the great music, if we have good preaching, if we have nice, friendly, warm people, all of those are good things. There's nothing wrong with any of them. But somehow we believe if we just do that, then the kingdom will grow. People will come into faith in Jesus. If we pray enough, if we shout enough, if we sing loud enough, if we have a pretty enough building. The truth is, none of those really work. Haven't worked in a very long time. What really works is what Paul, is, uh, what Peter, sorry, is asking us to do. He's asking us to invest our lives in the lives of others. See, the assumption is that if you actually have somebody who's asking you about the reasons for your hope and your faith, then they must know you well enough to do that. You must have invested enough in them for them to actually know you and trust you to ask you the great questions of life. About 15 years ago, Sheila is my wife. Sheila and I met this wonderful person who was not close to God particularly and certainly ostracized him not interested in church at all, but she had been raised in quite a legalistic home and had walked away as a teenager and had never come back. And so this is about 15 years ago now. 
So uh, it was through a business issue, and we started to do business, and she found out I was a pastor, and uh, there was a little bit of resistance at the beginning, but we had connection, and we had some business dealings, and and she started to ask me questions. And I, I realized right away that she was not ready for me to tell her that God wanted her in his kingdom. She just wasn't ready. She wouldn't have been ready. Impossible. So I just really felt in my spirit that I would let her do this at her pace. That's what I felt God wanted me to do. And so uh, this went on for a long time, 10 years, in fact. So we started to connect with them. Every time there'd be little discussions about God or faith or the church and and I let her lead those discussions by her questions. We would talk and share, never judgmental, never critical. We started to interact as friends. We started to be in each other's homes. We actually visited them on vacation in Florida once. And so she and her husband. And so we just we became really close. And along the way, the questions got deeper and richer. And about five years ago, she came to faith, marvelously came to faith and began to share her faith with everybody around her, including her husband. See, that, that's, it seems strange when you think of it, 10 years, it seems so long. But I know people who've been Christians their whole lives that have never led anybody to Jesus. And so I've had the privilege of doing this numbers of times, but I think this is more common today, this method, this, this issue. So always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have the hope that we have in christ and there's just this assumption that we're actually going to be in a relationship for that to happen it doesn't happen without the relationship and so um amazing really when i think about it and now i've watched this person just grow in faith and just now invite others into the kingdom and she's become a true disciple she follows jesus and she's become a disciple maker so other people are heading to the kingdom because of her. The other thing, and Peter puts his finger on something really important, the other great assumption is this. The assumption is that we will have an answer for those who ask. We'll actually have something to say. And that comes out of the first part, the first assumption, that we actually have a relationship with Jesus, that when they do ask, we can tell them, I have hope because I know I'm going to have eternal life. I have hope because God loves me. I have hope because I'm a member of God's family. I have hope because I'm one of the children of God. I have hope because I can love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I have hope because he's helping me love my neighbor. I have hope because he's changing me to be like himself. The big word in this one is reason. And it's interesting that he defines reason with two other words, hope and respect. And so thank God for the hope that we have. Thank God that, that we just have it. I, I was asked yesterday, I was doing a podcast with somebody, uh, sorry, this week by the time you see this, but I was doing this podcast and said, what, what do you see for the future? And I'm, I'm 76, almost 77 now. And as much as I see continuing to serve God and want to do that and my family serving God, at the same time, I have this hope inside of me that one day I will go to be with the Father. It'll be forever and ever and ever. And so I, I thank God for the hope that burns within us. Thank God for the hope that is ours, that life doesn't end when life ends. Life begins when life ends. And then Peter uses this other key word, this word respect. And so he says, if we're going to respect people, we ought to honor them. We ought to share with them as they are, not as we are. Jesus Jesus modeled this over and over. Have you ever read the New Testament and you read the stories of Jesus? It's worth doing. Look at all the people he interacted with and how he interacted with them. He interacted with them as they were. And so for a tax collector, he goes to Tita's house. And for a woman with an issue of blood, he stops and she gets healed. And for a Roman governor, he actually, actually sends his word and performs a miracle. And for the disciples, he called them to follow him. And for a man at a pool who couldn't get healed, he didn't send him into the pool for healing. He healed him. Uh, over and over and over, Jesus deals with people so differently. He deals with them as they are. And there's no moment where he's judgmental or critical of them. He loves them. And he invites them into his kingdom. And so that's what God is asking us to do. In fact, Jesus spent so much time with people who were considered by the religious people of that day as sinners, he was criticized for spending so much time with them. See, Jesus had a plan for them. It's called love. It's the law of love. He wanted them in his kingdom, 
He wanted them to be part of his family. He wanted them to be loved and know they were loved just like we do. We can never underestimate the power of God's love in somebody's life. I've watched God save people that many of us wondered if that was even ever going to be possible. And God just invests in them. But he invests in them through us. Sometimes we see broken and arrogant and hurting people. And Jesus sees potential for the kingdom. Sometimes we see the poor and the marginalized and the different. And Jesus sees equality and oneness in the future. Sometimes we see resistance and skepticism and anti-Jesus and sin. And Jesus sees a person the Holy Spirit can convict of sin and convince that the Son of God can bring them from the outside to the inside. And I often pray, Jesus, help me to see others as you see them. Help me to see people who live in darkness in the light of your light that can touch their life and change them. As I was thinking about this, this message, I was, uh, I'm not sure why this came to my mind, but it did. Have you ever been traveling and there's just some massive building somewhere and, and you look at the building, you can't see inside at all because the, the, whatever they've done with the windows are glazed. And so if you're on the inside, you can look out. But if you're on the outside, all you see is this mirror reflection. You can't see inside at all. And many times that's how we live our lives. We live our lives so that people can see, but they, they only see a reflection. They don't really see the inside at all. And Jesus is saying to us through Peter, take the, take the, take the shine, take the glaze off the windows. Let people see inside. Let them see your walk with God. Let them see how much he loves you and how much you love him. Let them see your care for people in the family of God, the care for the people in your own family, and the care for people who are not yet in the family. Let them see that. Let them see it one-on-one. -on -one. Let them see it personal for you. Since I became a believer at eight, really a believer, really a believer at 18, I've always had people in my life that were outside the kingdom and loved on them. And along the way, I've had some opportunities that changed my life, and so it's not a big deal at all. But at one moment, I did get invited to lead our fellowship. I was there for 12 years. And I probably was about eight years in, and I remember this pastor calling me one day to talk about business, some church issue. But before we did that, he told me about um, having just led somebody to Jesus and helped them understand how much God loved them. And and uh, a personal one-on-one, -on -one, not because he was a pastor, but because he was a friend. And I confess, I, I, I'm listening to this, and I, and I just was so overwhelmed. And I started to cry because I realized I had got so busy with church issues and people and leadership and making international and national decisions that at that moment I couldn't find one person in my life that ate at my soul. I had people that I knew that were outside the kingdom. Some of them are family. But I didn't have anybody that I was sharing life with for their sake and for the sake of Jesus, just loving them because God loved them. And I determined at that moment that I would never let that ever happen again. And I had to do what I ask all of us to do when we realize that, okay, I really want to please the Father. Maybe I'm not pleasing God as much as I could. I had to go to 1 John 1 and 9, but if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I had to go there and confess that I had allowed my life to be so busy that I had missed one of the greatest things God wanted me to do. And I determined I would never let that ever happen again, and so I began to look for people. I began to ask God to open my heart to people. I began to ask God to bring people into my life and from that moment on, I've always had people who are outside the kingdom. I'm not going to give you their names because somebody might somehow listen to this broadcast and they would know who I was talking about. But these are people that I truly love. I pray for them all the time. I look for opportunities to be with them, share meals, share social interaction, share opportunity. Because I'm praying for the day that they will see that Christ part in me, that I've been set apart by God for His purposes. And for his use, and they'll ask me the question, why do you have this hope? Why do, you, why do you serve God? And with hope and respect for them, I will tell them how much God loved me, loves me still, and how much he loves them, and how much he wants them to have life, like I now know it in him. That's my prayer. It's my prayer for you. 
my prayer for the church, this is my prayer for our world. The world is not going to be changed by political action. It's not going to be changed by war. It's not going to be changed by economic prosperity. It's not going to be changed by education. Well, some changes come. If we really want to change the world, we need to change people's hearts. We need to know that God loves them. And the best way to do that is love them like God loves them. And love them enough and spend enough time with them and invest in them enough hmm. that one day they'll say, why do you have this hope? Why do you have this joy? And with great delight we will tell them. Can I say to you it doesn't happen in the first telling? Sometimes it happens in many tellings. It takes a long time sometimes. But if you've done that with somebody and, and, and there comes that moment when they have the life of Jesus in them. Not only will they never be the same, but you and I are never the same. We want to do it over and over and over again. Let's pray together. God, I pray for all the people that are listening that truly already do this and invest in their lives, and they've understood that loving your neighbor is not just loving people in the family of God, but loving people who are not yet part of the family of God. And so God, I pray that you would keep people in our lives that we can invest in, that we can love on, spend time with. And for all those who do that, I pray grace upon them and give them great opportunities and give them great, great victories. Let them see people as the fruit of their labor come to follow Jesus. And for all who know God and want to serve him and want to please him, but aren't really investing in others, God, help us to confess our sins and know that he, that you, God, will be faithful to forgive us. And give us another chance, a fresh start. And God, for everyone who's never led anybody to Jesus, I pray you'll open doors of friendship, relationship, opportunities to invest. And may they see fruit for their investment. And God, this is not just us having some kind of person that we see as a project. This is us actually loving people that God loves who do not yet know it. So help us to do it and do it well. And when they do ask us, may the hope we have in Jesus shine through us in a wonderful way. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're so glad that each and every one of you joined us today. Again, if this was your first time joining us, we would love to introduce ourselves. We encourage you to fill out a connect card under the I'm New section of our website so that we can stay connected. It's all for me. I hope you had a great week ahead and I look forward to seeing you again.